Hello everyone. I love Future Tech Tracks because that actually talks about what the art of the possible. Actually, this isn't as far as future as you might imagine. It's actually being used right now. So let's start, let's talk about Auras powering the next generation of cloud native. My name is Andy Block. I'm a distinguished architect at Red Hat. I work in our services organization. So I work with customers globally to really do a little bit of everything. If Red Hat productizes it, I've worked on it in the past. Everything from Red Hat Enterprise Linux to Kubernetes, OpenShift, and anything in between. Maybe not so much on the storage side, but eh, it's okay. Uh, I do focus on a couple different areas in particular, cloud native technology, security, CI, CD, and automation. And I try to evangelize technology throughout the community. So I do a lot of work in the open source community, showing how a lot of my work, honestly, in the open source community is focused on bringing the enterprise voice into the community. Most community members think that the world is all full of AWS and you can spin up things freely and talk to anything you want, right? Not so much. You go into an enterprise and there's going to be regulations, restrictions, you name it. So I try to bring that into the upstream so that folks can design appropriately so they don't get caught afterwards. Because I know I've worked with a number of projects, they've built and designed a perfect system and then realized, oh, we've got to include proxy support. Ooh, that's a mistake. I can tell you very few customers that I have that actually have proxies, that, that do not have proxies. I am a maintainer on two primary open source product projects, Helm. How many have heard of Helm? Package manager that takes up most of my time, honestly, these days upstream. Uh, very popular project, but popularity also takes away your free time. And I also work on a project called Auras, which we'll talk about in this session. I've also written several books on different cloud native technologies, one on Helm, one on Kubernetes security, and I have two books coming out now, uh, one around uh, Ansible automation and RHCE, the junior engineering exam certification, as well as Argo CD. So from the Christian Hernandez, from um, former from Red Hat, now he works at Acuity, he and I are putting together a book on Argo CD together. Ask me what I do on my day, on my so, we can all pretty much admit that the container and container technologies have played a pivotal role in today's cloud architecture. I can't think of it how today without a container in some form or another. So, for those who aren't as intimately familiar with containers, why are the, what are the benefits of them? Number one, resource utilization, being able to make use of a single hardware and be able to segment it up more efficiently, think about it, when it comes to like virtual machines, I spoke this morning about virtual machines and how it was more performant than traditional bare metal. Take it one step further here, where you can go ahead and chop up a, a virtual machine into multiple different slices. Consistency, you have a repeatable process for being able to drive out um, automation as well as any type of action you want. And then finally, speed. Containers start up like nothing compared to a VM. Most people know about containers, but they don't know about the underpinnings behind containers. There was actually a war not too long ago. Actually, it's maybe about 10 years ago. There was actually a container war. There was a number of different frameworks that were coming out there. There was Docker, Rocket, and a few others, and they weren't playing nicely. So uh, it actually caused quite a, quite, quite a kerfuffle when it comes to the open source community. And that's where the open, the open Container Initiative was born. Basically, it is a open source governance for how we express container runtimes and formats. So we can all play nice together, or nicer together. There are three primary pillars of the OCI that they focus on. One is the image specification. This is everything that it takes, the composition of an image itself, container image. One of the next one is the runtime specification. What does it take to run a container image? And then finally, distribution specification, which is how I store and distribute container images more broadly. So we're looking at the Quays, the Dockers, the Docker Hub is, pardon me, the, the Azure Container Registry, you name it. Any, any type of container registry is you know, bound by this distribution justification. How many of you, show of hands, have actually looked in the underpinnings of container images? Oh, wow, <laughs> wow. 
Well, I'm gonna have to go really deep for you guys and gals then, because <laughs> clearly you know what's going on. Um, I always like to say that you know Scott, who actually is at the conference, which I can actually go and hunt him down. He led me to when I first started out with containers. This quote: "It was in the early days of containers that continues to resonate with me. They're just fancy files and processes. That's all they are. They're just tarballs. We have to look underneath it and a bunch of metadata JSON. So." It basically starts out as the OCI image consists of an image manifest, an optional index index, image index, a set of file system layers, and a configuration. That's it. That's what it takes to get a container running. And this is basically a lineage of how all of these play together. So you have an index image, which then has an index, which then or probably has an image, which then has a set of manifests, which has a config and several layers. That, in a nutshell, is a 30,000 foot view of what a container looks like today. And this is what an OCI uh, image manifest looks like. So if I have, let's just say, a AMD64 based image, this is what it looks like under the covers. You have your media type. Your media type here, how many of you, now I, I go back and date myself here, how many have heard of memes, M-I-M-E type? Do you know what they're called now? Anybody? They're not called meme types anymore. They're, they're gone. I remember clicking on meme type, except this meme type back in Windows, what, 98? Because they were getting like some JavaScript error and it says, please go ahead and accept this. I'm like, sure, I'll do it, sure. Meme types are no longer a thing. They're now called media types. So a little bit of history for you. They've now gotten moved over to media types. And they're governed by the IANA. I'm not going to go ahead and put the acronym to, to fruition, basically it's a governance body that allows you to register known types with each other. That becomes very important when it comes to a concept we're gonna talk about shortly uh, regarding OCI artifacts. So this is basically what it looks like. You have config, manifest, as well as a set of layers. And as you see here from the layers, they're just tarballs, compressed tarballs, that's all they are. Here's your terms at a glance. Basically, you have an image manifest. It's basically a document that describes the components that make up a container image. We just looked at one then. An image index is a list of related manifests. So if you have a single container image, or you have, like, you know, you have everything from you know, Quita.io slash UBI slash UBI9. It's the UBI9. That's not the actual location, but you get the idea. You're going to have potentially an AMD flavor. You're going to have an ARM flavor. You're going to have a couple IBM flavors. All of those get create, um, put packaged into an index image and allow you to then refer to them. So you can say, give me all the different architect architectures that are supported by this image. You then have the image layout, which is basically that file system layout of the container image itself. You have the image configuration, which is basically a document, document an optional document that provides more insights about the image itself. A descriptor, which is basically the, the type and metadata and content address of the content. So basically, the top two layers, or actually basically these three, are called a descriptor. And then finally, you have the media type, which is that format. That, that media type is going to come very important very soon. So we know what images are. We've used them for about a decade now. But wouldn't it be nice if you're able to store additional content types in container registries aside from container images? And it's possible. I kid you not. There's a concept called OCI artifacts. Before looking at the session today and walking in the door, how many have heard of OCI artifacts before today? How many have used OCI artifacts today? For those of you who had your hand down, how many use Helm? So you know you can, did you know you can store your Helm charts as OCI artifacts? We're and especially if you're interested in Helm, we're going to have some fun today. Yeah, I, like, I like Helm a little too much. So basically, basically, OCI artifacts enables you to store additional content types in container registries aside from container images. And some underlying, underlying technologies behind it. The type of artifact, i.e. the media type, is determined based on the contents of the manifest. The, it requires explicit support from each registry for you to actually make use of the artifact functionality. You need to have support in the registry itself. Don't worry, all the major ones su support it, so you're not going to find one that doesn't these days. And then finally, the 
Artifact spec was officially brought in as part of the OCI 1.1 image, image um, spec that came out in March of this year. Yay! So what are some use cases for OCI artifacts? Okay, software building materials. You can store those now in OCI artifacts. Signatures, if you use cosine, for example, all of those are being stored as OCI artifacts in registries. And then we start going into the next gen side of things. Software packages, you can store jars and RPMs as OCI artifacts. I'm gonna blow your mind in a little bit later because you're gonna say, that does what now? A little, a little bit of a teaser. And finally, heard a lot about AIML. You can store AIML models in registries and even sign them too. So you can see how many of these technologies are starting to come together. So. Let's go into the underpinnings of OCI artifacts and how it applies to the OCI specification 1.1. So finally, what are some guidance? 1.1 finally provided some more clear guidance about how to make use of artifacts. Before it was kind of a kludge of recommendations and you're kind of on your own. It allows you to now specify the artifact type based upon one of two things. Either it's going to be the artifact type, a new field on the image manifest, or you can specify it at within the config.media type side as well. If you're using the artifact type top level argument, the config.media type must include in what they call an empty descriptor. Basically, it's just an empty JSON file. Basically, null out. And this is what the media type looks like. If you look here, this is your media type. Content is just literally an open closed um, JSON document. And this is how you can now start to, you, but the cool part about this is with 1.1, you can now start to create relationships behind different components within OCI registries. So, for example, let's say I had an image, Conta typical container image, it runs in Kubernetes, it runs on my laptop, you name it. I can go ahead and now create a relationship between related documents. I'll say I had an image, or a signature, pardon me, that is associated to that image. Maybe I have an SBOM associated to that image. I can now go ahead and use OCI artifacts and what is called the refers API to now create that relationship between these different components that are now stored inside the container registry. It provides this new API that returns a list of manifests where there's a subject field within the OCI uh, manifest that matches the digest of the request. So basically, the subject field on each individual object, this SBOM signature, for example, will contain the SHA digest within the actual resource it refers to. And that's how the registry can then find who it points to. Very similar to if you're in Kubernetes. If you're familiar with Kubernetes and owner references, same thing. So what are some of the benefits of OCI artifacts? Well, you can see you, we now have a standardized way to format and package content. We now have a way to centralize, centrally manage our content. So I can go ahead and manage it all through a container registry. Um, you know, I don't have to create separate tools. One of the challenges I have when working with customers, especially at the edge in GitOps, I'm, this is one of the things I'm really passionate about right now is I use Argo a lot. How many of you use Argo TD in the past? One of the biggest pain points I have, especially when I'm doing demos and I have customers with this problem, is I need Git. I need another component to be available from my Kubernetes cluster, right? Because it contains my Git manifest, right? But why do I need Git? Tell me why I need Git. Anybody? For the version switch? Yes but you don't necessarily need it from an Argo standpoint. You don't need it because all Argo needs is, a, is an endpoint to go retrieve manifests, right? That happens to be potentially a atomic SHA. So one of the things I'm working on in the upstream community is how we can add direct OCI support in Argo CD. Because I may not have Git server, but I know that if I have Argo CD, I have at least a container registry somewhere all the content's being served by OCI, by an OCI image. So what we're doing in the upstream is being able to then store your manifest in an OCI artifact, and Argo will just retrieve it natively. 
I can then remove the entire management plane of Git. Because I have many customers where Git can no be nowhere near production because that's a separation of concerns. So even though, even though it doesn't really provide development resources to their security teams, it is a development resource. So that's one of the areas that I'm trying to get around. Plus from a management standpoint, I don't want to deal with the Git server. I love Gitia, I love a lot of the other tools out there, but I don't want to deal with managing it. I want a simple demo. It's all I want. I don't want Git. And if you're familiar with GitHub yesterday, it had a little bit of an oopsie moment where it was out for like five hours. I could avoid that as another point, potential point of failure. And then finally, I can evolve, uh, evolve my existing practices, being able to manage additional types of content using tried and true methodologies, using CI speed to instead of now pushing my manifest to a Git server, it just gets pushed to my OCI artifact registry. That's it. Any of the same things. So, OCI artifacts are actually becoming quite popular these days. We talked about Helm a little bit. We talked about SigStore, you know, using Cosign. How many of you, how many of you have a Mac computer? How many of you, how many use Homebrew as a way to install content? Did you know that the content that's being served by Homebrew is now being served as OCI artifacts? You may not have known this, it's true. So you can go ahead and, so you're actually under the covers using OCI artifacts without even knowing. So try installing something tonight, maybe just turn on the debug mode when it comes to the request. You'll see it going out to either Docker Hub or whatever endpoint. They happen to be scoring it, I think it's Docker Hub. I believe they have an enterprise agreement with Docker Hub so that they don't get rate limited. Because, you know, we don't want to get rate limited when we want our servers and our software. A Trivi is another one that, is, that also provides, you know, scanning tools for container images and vulnerabilities. Then Flux. Flux is another CI, uh, CI uh, pardon me, GitOps tool. It's very similar to Argo CD. So the Docker uh, ecosystem brought up containerization to the masses. Why do you think it was so popular? Why Docker and why nothing else? Why is it easy? Because they have tools to make it easy. I could just go ahead and just do Docker run and I get a Postgres server. That was the biggest thing that blew my mind when I first got Docker. I, it took me forever to get a database server to hook up. I can go ahead and spin one up in 30 seconds. It's those tools that make a technology so approachable and relatable. Because if I hear about it, it, it's like, okay, that's nice. If I can get my hands on it and play with it, you can go ahead and actually use it and it becomes sticky. And then allows you to learn about it and share your knowledge with others and your technologies with others. So, that's what the Aura's project is. And of course, you come in now. Yes, I have a lot of tabs, thing, or a lot of windows. <laughs> Are they in the right uh, artifacts? Uh, not quite. All right. And you went way too far. Way too far. Wow. Okay. Auras. I know that the screen was so shocked with it. It blew, you know, blew my mind. It is a CNCF project since 2021. And it provides the tools for leveraging OCI artifacts at scale. That's what the Auras project is. And then there's a lot of industry-wide adoption of Auras in the ecosystem. We'll talk about some of the projects that are already leveraging OCI artifacts with Auras. So what does Auras contain? It's got a CLI for you to make use of OCI artifacts in a very similar way that Docker make, makes it. So it has many of the same commands. So if you, if you made the transition from Docker to Podman, you can make the transition from Podman to Auras in terms of how to understand the technologies. It's very, very similar. You have a, or as push, or as pull, and a couple other, or as manifest. Docker is also, or Podman is also including or support for or as manif uh, Podman manifest coming up. So there's going to be a lot of tools that are going to have a lot of the same commands. Multi language support, aside from the Go based CLI, there's also support for Rust that just got brought in, Python, Golang, .NET. Those are all available as clients for Auras. There's a very healthy and vibrant open source community behind it what I play in, and I have a lot of fun doing it. Met a lot of, actually, some great people. And we have representation from a lot of co companies, from 
Docker, from Microsoft, from Red Hat, a lot of, a lot of, a lot of great people working on this project. So how do you use Auras? Well, it's going to be very similar to how you use other tools now. I have an artifact. Let's just, let's just call it um, artifact.tex. It's got some content, whatever, it's a text file. I want to push it to a container registry that happens to be running locally on port 5000. I'm going to go ahead and use Auras push, localhost 5000, give it a random a repository name, hello-artifact, colon v2. Specify the location of where the file exists on your file system, and then add in a media type, text plane. Boris will go ahead and try to find it by default if you don't provide one, but I want to be explicit here because it makes it easier to relate. I can also create a custom config manifest and use Auras to push that as well. So I can do Auras push, localhost 5000, hello artifact v2, Use the dash dash config option, specify the config.json file that you create, give it a custom media type if you want. So I'm creating my own little custom media type. Application BND, Acme, Rocket, Config, V1. You may ask, how the heck do you come up with that name, right? Well, IANA, that, that regulatory body I mentioned earlier, has a set of rec uh, recommended um, conventions for how you create a media type. There is nothing that prevents you from creating one of your own and using it, but try to play nice and go ahead and use the same pattern that's being used by the community and the industry. What you will have trouble doing is registering it actually and officially within INA. I went through the process of registering the Helm types with INA. They take that stuff seriously. It took us about six months after we went through back and forth, back and forth, making sure it looks good. So if you if you go ahead and you search the INA database, you'll see my name it's buried in some of the documents because I was on the, ended up submitting it. Highly recommend it. It was fun, but it's a process. And then pulling artifacts just like Docker and Podman itself, or as pull, and it pulls it down, and it would then end up with a text file on your file system. It's that easy. I mentioned OCI, uh, uh, the Refers API, and creating relationships. You can go ahead and attach Using the, using the aura as attach command to be able to attach an artifact to an existing container image. Basically, you do aura as attach, give it a type, specify the location of the parent object, and then the artifact you want to attach. Then you can also discover relationships. You can actually create a tree of relationships, all visually done through the aura's discover CLI. OK, enough talk. Let's go see auras in action. Ready? All right, let's do it. So. I'm going to use Helm as my little reference architecture, and I have 10 minutes to do so, so let's see if we can get the demo done in 10 minutes. All right, so for those of you who are unfamiliar with Helm, it's a CNCF graduated project. It's got a packaging format known as charts. It's got a CLI tool to manage the lifecycle and packaging. It's got a rich SDK, so if you have a tool that wants to leverage the Helm ecosystem, you can go ahead and integrate that into your application. It's Golang-based, but there's a number of other tools that have been created around it. And then you can create a chart and publish that either within a HTTP-based re uh, registry or repository, pardon me, or most importantly, as part of an OCI registry. All right. So Helm was actually one of the first projects that made use of OCI artifacts. It had full support in Helm 3.8. We're on 3.15, so any modern Helm client has OCI support. And there are three media types that are registered with the IANA, the Helm package itself, the tar GZ, the config manifest that we create. And then if you are assigning your charts using Helm, the providence file is also now registered too. If you're interested in learning about the Helm OCI manifest definition, you'll see this is what it looks like. You have your custom config media type, Layers, which is basically your provenance file and the tar GZ that you end up. This is what ends up being created when you run Helm push. This gets created in the background. But guess what? We're going to actually bypass that during the demo. You're going to see how you can do this yourself. A lot of adopters are Auras itself. The open policy agent, Argo CD. Yes, we talked about more having more native support in Argo CD, but Argo CD does support OCI right now through Auras, through its existing functionality. So if you're using the OCI uh, enabled type, 
within Argo CD. It's actually using ORMs under the covers. Zarf, which allows you to manage um, container images and other content in a disconnected uh, environment. And then Notary is another tool to sign content. Let's do a demo, shall we? Let's go ahead and explore the lifecycle of an OCI-based Helm chart. We'll create and package the Helm chart as an OCI artifact. We'll look at the definitions that it ended up creating. And then we'll look at how auras can participate in that life cycle so you can get a better understanding of not only how OCI artifacts are created, but how auras can be used at scale. All right, so I'm gonna go, I'm gonna go cheat because I'm good at cheating. Sorry, I'm only good at cheating because you've done it too many times and you fail. So we're gonna create a brand new Helm chart called OCI Artifacts Demo, okay? Helm Create OCI Artifacts Demo. Is that big enough? Can it be bigger? Good enough? Okay, awesome. Sorry for the folks in the back. You may have to squint a little bit. All right, next thing we're gonna do is we're gonna remove a lot of the boilerplate content. Basically everything in the templates folder, see ya. Yep. All right, so there's nothing in the chart whatsoever. I'm gonna go ahead and update the chart.yaml with a little nice little fancy description. You know, it says OCI artifacts demo. We're gonna use my favorite YQ tool, which is a tool for managing uh, y YAML content. To basically say, or as artifacts demo, it's done that, great. I'm gonna create a config map in Kubernetes. It's gonna basically say devcomp.us, because it's gonna have a config map called OCI-artifacts.demo. It's then gonna go ahead and create a new key called event with a description or a content of devcomp.us. And we're gonna pipe that to a configmap.yaml file on the file system. We're using the dry run command, so it doesn't actually create it in Kubernetes. Talk to my Kubernetes cluster, great. All right, next thing we're gonna do now is we're gonna go ahead and package the chart up. Thank you, package, goodbye. We now have a new Helm package of version 0.1.0. I'm now gonna go ahead and do a Helm push and push it to a registry that I happen to have running in my OpenShift cluster. I'm running the OpenShift container platform and I have it running in AWS, doesn't really matter where it runs, but I'm just using that as my reference implementation right now. And as you see, it's now pushed it to my artifact registry, registry.apps.cluster. yada, 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 yada slash artifact.oci-artifacts.demo version 0.1.0. I'm gonna create a brand new project in OpenShift. If you're unfamiliar with OpenShift, a project is just like a namespace with a couple additional pieces of metadata. That's it. Oh, fun. We're gonna go ahead and delete the project I created last night. OC, I did some testing last night, so don't worry. OC delete project. OCI artifacts. It's like riding a bike, right? You want to be able to ride the bike, fall off, fall off a few times when no one's looking, and then go ahead and do it live, and everyone thinks you're amazing. Now we have a new project created, but just like that. Now what we're going to do is we're going to go ahead and install that chart to the cluster, into that project. Okay. Pulls down, pulls down the OCI artifact, and now it's deployed. Right? Great. Let's go ahead and let's review the chart. Let's go ahead and let's look at see what, what charts currently deployed in my namespace. Looks like a Helm chart, simple stuff. Let's go ahead and let's grab that config map that we created manually. And now it's currently deployed on the cluster as part of the Helm chart. Beautiful. You'll see here it's got event devcomp us. Kind of what we specified in that dry run command. Great. Now what we're gonna do is we're gonna go ahead and we have version one, all maintained using Helm, right? We're gonna go outside the box and not use one Helm command to update it, okay? We're gonna use auras and, and a lot of tooling around it. So let's go ahead and let's update the event. So instead of saying devconf US, it's gonna say devconf US 2024. We've gone ahead and we modified that file locally on the file system. So the YAML file itself on the file system is now has that new content updated. Next thing we're gonna do is we're gonna update the version of the chart to be 0.1.1. We're gonna just do a simple incrementation of that. Now what we're gonna do is we're gonna package the chart up again. So now we'll have a 
a 0.1.1 .1 version. So if we just do an LS, you'll see there's going to be the uncompressed chart, the 0.1.0, and now the 0.1.1, the two versions. Now what we're going to do next is we're going to go ahead and create the config manifest. If you look at the config manifest when it comes to Helm, do you know what it is? It's a JSON representation of the Helm chart.yaml file. It's all it is. So I'm going to go ahead and basically use the YQ command with an output of JSON, and it's going to spit that out. So if we cat that, you'll see it looks just like we expect it to be, a chart.yaml file in JSON format. It's got the new version, 0.1.1, that we created previously. Now we're going to use auras. And instead of using Helm push, we're going to use auras to be able to push not only the, the JSON file containing our config manifest, but also the compressed Helm package. We're going to specify the config type, which is going to be config.json, and then also the media type that Helm expects, and then the registry that it's going to be pointing to, and then the, the tar file, which is going to be the package chart itself. Okay? Auras has now pushed that to the, to the registry. You'll see it's pushed the different types, everything from the package file, the config JSON, and then now the manifest. All there now. And now I'm just going to use Helm. I'm going to use Helm to update the chart, to point to the new location. We didn't use Helm to push the chart or manipulate the OCR artifact. We use Auras. We'll update it. It just pushed, it just upgraded like anything else, just like the native Helm tools to use. Just under the covers, it's just using auras in how we're managing our OCI artifacts. And all I need to do here, once again, is to do a Helm LS. There it is. You can see it's running in version 1.1. I can use Helm history, OCI, OCI artifacts demo. It looks just like any other chart we would expect. We can then go ahead and confirm that the 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 config map has been updated with the cool ver with the cool DevConf US 2024, which is that new version we gave it. And we can even go in and get more information from the pushed artifact itself. So we look when we want to go back and look at the artifact itself. We can use some of the tools that Auras provides. We can go ahead and look at the actual manifest that Auras produced. And that's the or that's the manifest. It looks just like what we expect it to be on the Helm side. You can see the two different media types. You have the manifest, you have the config manifest, you have the tower file, just as we expect. We can then go ahead and fetch the config. Great, let's do that. Perfect. There's a the config manifest, which is that JSON file we created. I'm gonna go ahead and now pull the actual content itself of the chart. So I'm just gonna do a mcdir test just to get out of this directory. We'll just go into a test directory. And I just went ahead and did that. DevConf for us test. Now we're now in the test directory. Just clear this up a little bit. And the last thing we're gonna do is we're gonna pull down this chart. Just go ahead and just do a Aura's pull. That's fetching the config. That's definitely not right. Uh, it's because I went ahead and I combined two commands. We'll just do helm pull, get rid of the fetch config. You'll see it pulled down the file. I have a tar file. If I just do a tar gz xf, it looks just like a, tar, like, a, like a helm chart to me. So basically, we've now demonstrated how to not only make use of helm OCI artifacts, but also then use auras to be able to replicate exactly what Helm does under the covers and be able to in inspect all pieces of this artifact. I know I'm out of time. Sorry, I really wanted to show you this awesome demo. I'm happy to answer any questions you have afterwards. Thank you for the time today. Thank you so much, Andrew. Are we at time? According to, according to that, I was. But I'm happy to answer any questions if we have a few moments. Okay, is the next speaker here? Oh, I see. I see. Oh, so perfect. So, so I'm okay. happy to answer you can any questions. Just go and bother him. Any questions? Yes. Do you want to go first? Ah.
Um, are you engaged at all with the pulp community? Because I see this and I'm like, wow, you could definitely use this in satellite for RPM and they already do container distribution kind of stuff there. I could see it for Ansible since pulp is also the backing there for execution environments and yep. for collections. So for me, it's like, oh, we have OCI to do all the things and then everything gets simpler along the way. I've had many conversations with many different teams at Red Hat because we have a lot of different teams that this applies to. I'm working very closely to, with, with, as you can probably expect, with the Equate team. And they're doing a lot of work around adding OCI support. They, you can now push OCI content to Equate.io. For the longest time, there were only a few types that we supported, but now we support any arbitrary type to enable different opportunities. Well, yeah, when it comes to like pulp and satellite, this is definitely one there. And I've had conversations in the past regarding that. I'm having, and I have good conversations with the um, Podman team and the Node team with OpenShift to be able to showcase how we can make use of the technology. And then I'm also, I'm also working very closely with the OpenShift AI team and the model registry team because they're looking at storing models within OCR artifacts. Um, so great presentation, thank you. Uh, uh, as Red Hat uses uh, Conflux as its new internal pipeline, um, we are actually looking to use ORUS and OCI artifact registries. I don't know if you've talked to any of the. I've talked to Brian in the past. Okay, yeah. Um, so um, we're looking especially to do it just to hand off our arbitrary artifacts yep. for like Mac and Windows and all these other different um, platforms. Um, what's like the logical limit of the amount of like I guess let's say files you could reference under one artifact, or would or is a recommended way to just have a separate artifact per file, I guess, if that makes sense. Is there one to many or should it be a one to one relationship? I think that uh, in terms of, this is where it gets interesting because this is all new. I will tell you that the actual amount of folks who are leveraging the refers API is so small. I was doing some research not too long ago and there was like one or two projects that are actually using it in earnest. Right. I see it being used a lot moving forward, but a lot of the tools are just getting up to speed because I, me I mentioned the FEC was just finalized in March mm -hmm. and just only a few of the container image registries support it fully. Does so Quay support it fully? Quay should, yes. It does because I, okay. I had I discussed with on the PM a couple weeks ago. So it does fully support it. Yes. Okay, because our OCI registry is gonna be in Quay. So I'm trying to figure out you if should we need be to good. have like separate Quay repo. Yeah, so I'm trying to figure out like how we're gonna implement that. So I well, I we would talk do, more. We will talk more afterwards. Yeah. yeah. You mentioned earlier about potentially something you'd like to see is instead of having to use like Git, being able to just store like some Git repository instead in the OCI yes. um, artifact. How would that look? Would it just be essentially a, like a, some artifact that then points that has a bunch of files in it? Yep. That's all it all to okay. well, the way um, I'm, I'm looking at, because it's going to evolve. This is all brand new. It's upstream. It's going to be, my initial implementation is it's going to be a compressed zip. A tar GZ of a file system. If you look at like how Argo CD manages it, it in reality is just a file system. It's just reading a file system. I'm not looking at replacing like the Helm type. I'm looking at just the Git type. I can go ahead and I can say, okay, this content, whatever content it could be. Remember, the way Argo manages it, it's just content, and how you render it is up to the implementer. So if I want to have it in a format of customize, great. The Helm chart, great. But I don't care at that point. All I care about is making it so that that content is made available on the repo server disk, and then it's up to it runtime what type of content it needs to render. So as long as I can get it on the repo server disk, Argo can just do its thing. That's why it's so easy. If you actually look at the underlying implementation, it's really easy because all you need to do is make the content there, and then Argo just handles the rest. If you're zipping that stuff up, is there a limit to how big that zip can be? It comes down to, at that point, a limit of the registry itself. There's nothing in the OCI spec that says you have to be within a certain limit. But I know Quay does have a limit. I think Gurney might have mentioned that one of the limits that he hit. And that's also, as, as we mentioned, it's per registry. So, so it, it, it can be different from Quay, Docker Hub, et cetera, but there are also quotas that you can apply as well. Right. 
And that's where it gets interesting when it comes to, and that's one of the areas that we've been thinking about when it comes to Argo. How do you handle multiple layers? Do you want to do it all in one layer? Do you want to have a history? So you, so you, especially when we're coming from Git world, how do you manage? How do you manage prior revisions and being able to get back to that? With because in reality, you could overwrite the tag. So there's many different pros and cons. That's one that the community is going to just continue to weigh and architect. I love talking about this. I could talk about this all day. Ask me what I well, ask me what, what also I do on a daily basis. Yeah. Yeah, so uh, just one quick commentary. So in Conflux today, we actually have an operation mode where um, we are using OCI artifacts yes. to establish a, a trust between you know, a git clone task and then a build task to make sure that what was cloned is actually the thing that was built. And the way we do that is we actually uh, tar the whole git clone, whatever was cloned, and then we just throw that as an OCI artifact yep. and you remove them. So uh, the, uh, the other thing is, uh, so we've been storing things in the registry, like, and it's great to see that there's some traction now for officially supporting this, yep. but we've been doing this for, for a while, right? Uh, and what comes to mind is how uh, a Red Hat, especially we, how we share uh, source code. Mm -hmm. um, so we have this idea of source container images, which basically you're just distributing like SRPMs via the registry. I, I look and for those of you who are very familiar with like the operator framework, a lot of the operator framework was kind of a faux container. Basically there was content that was packaged into an image that just contained files. We shouldn't be doing that. We should be doing that as just straight OCI artifacts. That's one. Now, same thing when it comes to like the model registry and some of the work around Kubeflow. They were creating what they, what they call the model car that was basically running that same process. I've been working with, with one of the Red Hatters who is a maintainer on that project who looked at adopting OCI artifacts instead to not have this container that just runs randomly in the background. There's also, very important, a new Kubernetes enhancement proposal, proposal that got accepted a couple weeks ago that allow you to directly mount an OCI artifact within Kubernetes. So you can now mount an artifact as a volume in your artifact. So if you're, especially if you're doing AI ML models, that is absolutely crucial because you can go ahead and be able to interact with the model itself locally, but then have it run as a, you know, a file system that you can maintain. So, so the, the quick question that I had was, uh, uh, do you have any sort of like advice or guidelines for, you know, people that were storing stuff in the container registry before, before there was like an official yeah. way of doing it? To transition that over to something that's more, you know, that actually fo follows the guidelines, uh, and not just makes it seem like, oh, this is a layer, but not really. Uh, what, do you have any what, suggestions? What I would do right now is don't worry about the multiple layers. Just get content into that format. Also, think about how you want to that media type, because you can do media type checking on the on the manifest itself. So, especially if you're developing tools against it, you don't want to just so hypothetically. Let's say you, you want to you consume an, an artifact. If it's an AI ML model, you're going to consume an artifact that's gigs and gigs and gigs, and then you realize that, oh, it's not what I want. So you've now transferred all that material down to have your system blow up. Instead, you can look at the manifest and say, does it have the appropriate type? Reject it before you even pull it. That's, I, I've been pushing that on the Argo side, that we need to have a known type that we can then validate against and have our tools validate against, but have it in a way that, my goal is to have the Argo CD CLI be a way that you can publish the content more natively to the community because I don't want to have them download yet another CLI. But we want to make it in a way that any implementer can use a tool of their choice. So they don't have to use the Argo CD CLI, but they have a set of guidelines and practices that they can follow, and it produces the same amount of content. You look at the demo here today. I didn't use the Helm CLI. I used Aura's, but I followed the spec that Helm uses produce the exact same content. As you saw, the Helm CLI tools had no problem with the content, even though I did nothing with actually creating it, using it. That's going to be the most important thing, is this interoperability between tools. I, I was going to say, functional, functionally, for, for me, kind of from the, the build delivery, everything, how to package things in a boxing space, and also as someone who enjoys misusing how to package things oh, yeah. in, in all sorts of boxes, um, this opens up a lot of possibilities, and it's it necessarily sounds like an abstraction layer, 
we've we've made a very abstract API for pulling, pushing, and updating some layer of things. Mm -hmm. And all of the tool set that we did for containers still works here, and it's just there's no OS layer. There is just some context inside. So, I mean, one of the cool parts about this is how many of you are familiar with, um, with Red Hat Image Mode, Image Mode for Rails? That's a newer technology that was just introduced in May at Red Hat Summit. It uses OCI artifacts. We're now able to store operating systems within OCI artifacts. And one of the cool parts about the underlying technology behind it is you can now boot container images. Yes. I am working with that team, too. I just want to ask one follow-up question to your earlier wait, point. Wait, 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 uh, wait. How can the maintainer of the session actually go ask, ask questions? <laughs> <laughs> okay, so um, relating to the AI ML model yes. use case, um, I think you mentioned that there's a size limit somewhere between 60 to 80, depending on the registry. Yes. Um, with really big models like large safe tensors, how does that work? And also, what formats do you guys um, actually support? Is it stuff like GGUF or is it like the hugging face format as well? The format doesn't matter. Because in the end, it's a blob, it's a blob data. It's a blob. It's just oh. data. It gets stored as a blob. If you, if you consume content from registry.redhat.io, you know where the content's actually being stored and pulled from. The S3 bucket, I It's imagine. an S3 bucket. It's an AWS No, I guess S3 what I'm bucket. asking is like when you mount it in um, or I guess I'm thinking about the um, cube, like mounting it as an OCI artifact use case. Mm -hmm. uh, is, is it just a local file system, so like it, once it, you mount it? Exactly, because in, oh, the, in okay. the end, any type of volume you create in Kubernetes just is a, is a file system. Whether it be CSI, whether it be Windows, whether it be uh, you know, NFS, what it all is a file system. The underlying OCI um, CSI driver and CSI specification makes that available for Kubernetes. Very cool, thank you. Um, so I work on a relatively new project called Cube Archive. Think like Tekton Resolve, but instead yep. of just pipeline runs and task runs, mm -hmm. any resource you have in the cluster. Um, and so one of the things that we're starting to have to look into how to deal with is the child objects yes. of what we're archiving. And yep. one of the, I think the hard ones is gonna be uh, persistent volumes mm -hmm. and having to um, archive those as well. Yes. And Based on what you what you were talking about with being able to like, you can just create the tar file, stick it into the OCI registry, and then with the stuff that's going on with Kubernetes, be able to then like be able to mount an artifact that was there that you could then pull back. Yep, makes it easy to inspect. And so like on top of that, with like if you have say like a gzip thing that you've put into Quay. Yep. Are can you use tools like Scopio or some other thing similar to it to then be able to inspect what's actually in that? Artifact while it's still. In. You got You need to pull it down. Okay. So if you look at the example I gave earlier, when it comes to the layers, you can see the layer type. And that's where this media type is so critical, because you can then inspect and understand what's in there without having to pull it down. I knew that I had a Helm chart because it was the Helm manifest type. I knew it had a config. I knew it had a, had a Helm package because each layer had its own key thing. Which is why I'm also pushing on the Argo community to have its own formats too. This is where you design it and then have the tools to understand how to make use of it. And, but make sure you also publicize it. Get it out there. Don't have it be closed box because all these tools are open. You'll see it. Nothing to hide there. So act responsibly. Do we have any other questions for Andrew? I'm happy to, and I'm on all the slacks, so everything from GNCF, um, Kubernetes, a lot of the work on like OCI. Happy to have conversations with anyone. I'm here at the conference, I'm here for you tomorrow. Um, I love talking about this stuff. I love being able to open up opportunities. I've already seen some light bulbs come on from your faces. So thank you for the time today and have fun.